Okay, an overview, overview about this workshop, overcoming the odds to succeed. So last year, in the middle of the year, Jasper Richard Thomas, uh, who is an NROC senior football coach, he went to Philippines to uh, take part in the AFC Goalkeeper Level 2 coaching certificate course uh, with the support from Coach Hachi's, uh, Coach Development Grant, CDG. So for this e-workshop, is part of this uh, CDG sharing session where he will share how he overcome the various obstacles and difficulties, challenges in this course to succeed in obtaining the certificate. And um, basically, the challenges will be include things like suboptimal living conditions and also communication challenges with uh, the challenges in communication that you face with well, while working with uh, these uh, foreign instructors, coaches, and players. And last, last but not least, you'll also be sharing the technical expertise in goalkeeping coaching that he has learned from this course. So let us uh, give Jasper a warm welcome. And then Jasper, over to you, please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Chuan Leong. Thanks a lot uh, for handing over. Uh, hi, uh, hi, coaches. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Okay. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, overcoming the odds uh, to succeed. Okay, um, a sharing on what I've um, gone through in my coaching course. So, um, uh, Chuan Leong, want to shift back to the slides? Uh, yes, you yeah. can uh, share your slides. Yeah, okay. Your end. Um, So just give me a minute, coaches. Um, I'll just transfer it back. Okay, um, everybody can see the screen? I hope everyone can see the screen. Huh? Okay, um, so yeah, my name is, uh, is Jasper Richard Thomas. Okay, um, I'm a qualified AFC B diploma coach. And um, I'm a futsal coach also holding uh, level two and goalkeeping coach uh, level two and FAS sports trainer level two, uh, level one, sorry. So I'm currently with the Active SG Football Academy also coaching the um, under eights and uh, taking the DC teams under 10 and under 12 goalkeepers. So I'm with Active SG also as a futsal instructor, as a vendor. So I'm in the coaching line for 10 years experience in coaching, coach education, sports events. Currently, I'm taking my own women's team in the National Women's League. Uh, it's uh, ARG FC. It's known as uh, Ayraja Gryphons. So I'm also with NYP women's team uh, goalkeeping coach. <clears throat> so yeah, so this is just a background about me. So we'll move on to the next slide. Okay, the forward. Um, I'd just like to thank um, Coach SG and Sport SG for giving me this opportunity to rep uh, represent Singapore as one of the participants to go for the course in uh, Philippines. I'm very pleased that I received this uh, CDG award from Coach SG and Sport SG. I'm very thankful to them and, and this is why I would like to share um, why I, what, what I faced there and what what are the sharings? What are the good things? What are some of the bad experience we have faced uh, throughout this course? Okay, um, participants, uh, self-introduction. Huh? So um, you can uh, introduce yourself, which sport you are coaching, which level are you coaching at, Community level, developmental, or high performance. Number three is what do you want to learn from this workshop? All right, participants, uh, coaches, you can uh, start typing away in the chat box in the Zoom given below. Yep. This is so that we can understand your background a bit better and then hopefully also try to uh, take those into consideration during the workshop presentation. So, uh, 
Zhuanlong, so can I continue or while they are typing or what? Uh, I think you can just carry on from here first. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, coaches, so I leave it to you so you can type in uh, all these three questions. Okay. Uh, what sport you are coaching? What level are you coaching at? Uh, what do you want to take away from this workshop? So, I'll go, to the on, go on to the next slide. Yes, please. Okay, so um, the session structure will be on, uh, first thing will be sharing on technical aspects uh, of the course, uh, challenges faced and lessons learned during the course. Uh, number three is uh, key learning points and how these have impacted uh, my coaching and or your coaching also. Uh, and number four is participants reflection. Okay, so I, I hope you can see this picture. Okay, this is myself and my course mate. Uh, he's also a Singaporean, but he's not a CDG recipient, but uh, he also came, uh, he was sponsored by his club. He's currently with Tampines Rovers, uh, goalkeeper coach for the S League, for the Singapore Premier League. So um, his name is uh, William. So we both went for the course together. So it happened on... Um, Last year, 25th uh, July to 31st July in uh, Philippines, uh, Carmona Cavite. So if you see the, the Carmona Cavite at the background on the banner, this uh, place outside Manila. Okay, uh, it's a remote village. It's totally, a, really, literally a village, what you see in documentaries and in, in, in movies. Uh, so it's literally a village. Okay, um, this is the picture. Um, the blue, the guys in blue are all the part, uh, the coaches who came for the course. And the guys in red are the national under 16. Okay, uh, Philippines national under 16. They were preparing for the uh, AFC under 16 tournament at that point of time. They were training for that. So it was, this, this whole course was also part of their training they had to go through because the the goalkeeper coach was um, also part of our course. He is the first one from my left. He's their goalkeeper coach. The first, the first guy from my, from your left where you are seeing standing at the back. Okay, these are some of the pictures. And the, the first picture, me with the three goalkeepers. Uh, these three are the three national goalkeepers for under eighteen. So these are under 18 boys uh, and under 16 boys. So we were training both the under 16 and under 18 preparing for the uh, AFC under 16 and under 18 uh, championship. Uh, so we are the best of both worlds of training these uh, six goalkeepers in total. Okay, so this is the certificate. On the left is the certificate of attendance which will be given there. And once you pass... This is the certificate you will receive on your right um, from AFC. So I have a good look uh, before I change the slide. Okay. So we'll move on to the technical aspects from the course. Huh? So uh, what I've learned from this course is, firstly, because when you, when I had level one, I was taking the uh, grassroots guys and uh, the, the elite boys, like under 10, under 12. I was taking a uh, youth level and I was taking a tertiary level, uh, like the NYP goalkeepers, uh, so on and so forth. I, uh, so after that, I was um, with also the NFL team last season with Yunus Crescent. I was also training the goalkeeper over there. So once when I came to this course, it's totally a different, it's a totally a different uh, thing. Um, it's, a, it's like a total paradigm shift where you, where you go from um, uh, grassroots to youth. Now you are going to take over, going to take um, professional goalkeepers. How are you going to handle them? Uh, above 18, you know, uh, above 16 and, uh, you know, so on and so forth. So go and take the senior teams. So how you are going to handle them? And how do you coach them on their positioning, um, managing the goalkeeper's behavior in and out of the field, um, how, where, and when to parry the ball, 
you know, uh, in 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 times of the situation where they need to, whether they need to save the ball or whether they need to parry the ball away from the from their dangerous area, danger area, and how to deal with back pass. Okay, as you know that keepers um, gone were the days where keepers were only only knew how to use the hands, but now keepers literally have to be part of the team playing, you know, using their feet. You know, how they pass the ball, how they switch the ball and all this. So, this was one of the big eye-opener uh, there, back in the course. It, it's literally from scratch, they will teach you how a goalkeeper need to deal with back pass. Uh, because sometimes under pressure, what keepers will do is, I've seen personally in my own experience, they will, they will tend to handle the ball with their hand. End up, they will get a indirect uh, free kick. So, this how to how to escape from this kind of situations so we will we will coach the goalkeepers and how to play as a unit with the defenders you know let's say if your back four is a four 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 defenders or let's say three defenders how do you play with them as a unit you being the voice of the team at the back you know uh, commanding the defense line and everything apart from the 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 last man you are the one who is seeing the whole picture of the field so how you how to play with them as a unit and the timing to save, shot stopping the ball, commanding the six yard box as I told you the the the, the field the eighteen yard box and the six yard box how to command the defenders inside or the, the midfielders who are coming in to also support in the defense and managing the defenders for corner kicks you know which defender goes where who's going to the near post who's going to the far post who's going to go for the guy who player who's running in. So these are the things where goalkeeper, you know, he has to control a lot of things and um, handling the wall during free kicks. So normally uh, during free kick, the goalkeeper will be handling the wall. He will be telling the players uh, which side to shift so that they can cover one area of the of the danger zone and he can cover one side of the danger zone. So make sure the wall is well handled and the ball doesn't, you know, get off from the players. And conditioning for goalkeepers. Goalkeeper performance assessment. So this is what we used to do. So we used to do match analysis uh, during the course, and we uh, after the match analysis, we need to we will watch their game and we will do their match analysis, and we need to present up to them. So uh, next day or what, or uh, maybe two days later, we will present to them also their report how they played in the game uh, as a reference for them, and how to do counter attacking from set place. Let's say the opponent is having a free kick uh, at a 30 meter from your own goal area and how when you save the ball how do you distribute the ball for quick counter attacking you know these are the things where you know when you are taking a professional level teams uh, you need to you need to emphasize on these issues because we need to be majority in numbers we need to be superior in numbers when we are doing our counter attacking from set place and the last thing is support and communication which is very important in a team especially for goalkeepers so, because goalkeepers talk most of the time, if you notice. So, I'll go to the next slide. Okay, so um, the challenges are faced by uh, myself, uh, especially. So, first thing first, when, when you go for a course in overseas, like I told you, it's a totally remote village. And um, we, we had to make do with what we had. So, first thing first, when you go... For overseas course, what you're expecting is a Wi-Fi because every day you got assignments to do. Every day you got presentations to do. So when you can do your presentation is when you get back to your room. And we never stayed in a hotel. We stayed in a homestay. So we never stayed in a four-star or three-star hotel. We stayed, we had to stay in a homestay because the course was conducted there, which which is the practical, uh, which is the theory session. So in a, in a hall, in a homestay, the course was conducted. It was really a good classroom setup, but totally there's no Wi-Fi. Just imagine every day you have got assignments to do and you need to pluck out things from internet and you don't have Wi-Fi. And um, we as uh, Singaporeans, I sometimes have to um, use my phone using the, what is that called? Huh? Uh, using your own phone line to connect it to the, the internet, to the uh, laptop. So I have to always do that and, um, and my bill burst in these uh, six to seven days doing um, my assignments. And you can't even go to any shopping centers because every shopping center is like, um, probably the shopping center is about eight to 10 kilometers away from where we are standing, uh, staying. 
and um, there's no proper uh, transport facilities there. They only have this jeepney where you can take, you need to pay, but they only go to certain shopping centers and certain shopping centers don't have Wi-Fi. So, you know, we had all these kind of challenges and totally a remote village. Like I told you, shops and internet cafes are far away. The internet, the nearest internet cafe was like about um, five to seven kilometers away. So, um, like practically every day we were in the internet cafe doing our assignments. And I really have to give it to the, uh, the locals there because they were very helpful. Our cosmates were very helpful. They know that we are from overseas uh, participants and they really uh, did brought us in their car, brought us to the internet cafe. They had nothing to do. They actually, they could have gone back home also, but they actually brought us, you know, to the internet cafe, make sure we finished our assignments, then we come back. And uh, this was actually a joke. I and my cosmic William, we will always laugh upon. The water supply from the water tank got cut off on the first day when we checked in. So what happened was I went to open the tap. I went to open the tap and what happened was... Um, um, there was air coming out from the tap. So uh, I was thinking, uh, where do we get a water supply now? And it's a homestay and there's only one person working there and that person in the administration counter is not there most of the time. So we were like walking around practically the whole homestay to look for who's the person who's working there. And we told them that, uh, told him uh, that there's no water supply. So... Um, he came and he said that, oh, the water tank, the water is finished off. So you need to refill the water tank. And while refilling the water tank, we are not allowed to use the water also because the tank has to fill up to a certain level uh, before you can on the tap. So we, it took about 25 minutes to 30 minutes for us to wait to use, to get water. And water is totally dirty, uh, you know, living in a village area and living conditions were very poor. Literally poor. The first room we went, totally no aircon. Aircon was spoiled. And um, we had to change our room. We need to request for another room. And we couldn't get a room until the next day. So first day, if I'm not wrong, uh, we were sleeping without aircon. And we couldn't open the, the, the balcony windows also, the sliding doors also, because the mosquito was totally terrible because it was a forested area. And this uh, particular homestay was in the middle of a jungle. So outside the outside our homestay is totally like jungle area. So you just imagine every day it was raining and the mosquito was it was infest infestation that mosquito infest infested area. And um, local food totally was not appetizing. Uh, like you know they eat um, their local food they call chicken adobo. They have another food I, I I can't remember the name. It is like the the fetus of a duck. Literally, the fetus of a duck will be there. It was quite uh, unsightly to look at. So myself and my cosmate, we had to always go Western during these six to seven days. Uh, and, and like I said, there's no shops nearby. So we literally have to go to a nearest shopping center to go and have our uh, lunch and dinner and uh, breakfast also sometimes uh, if the session starts uh, very early, which, which normally is like the session starts quite early. So there was a language barrier also because um, like I told you, remote village people, they do not speak English. Some could not, uh, some only can speak very basic English, very basic, like uh, yeah, yes, no, why, what, how much, this kind of words only they knew. So I had to literally use a translator on the phone for communication um, with them. And there was no laundry also, in fact, in the homestay. So, um, the tap water also is very slow. So we had to literally find a laundry out, out there. Sometimes we had to use our, you know, we had to use our own soap and wash it and we have to dry it inside the room. Um, uh, majority of the course participants were locals, uh, like I told you, because we were only um, five foreign participants. I think both of us from Singapore, one from Guam, one from Bali, uh, white guy, but he's from Bali. He's coaching the Bali United. And another one is from Brunei. So we were the only uh, foreign participant. The rest were locals. Um, our course participants also, some could speak English so we can communicate uh, with them. Uh, well, some couldn't speak the, the language. So we had to communicate through the football language, you know. 
when we when we talk during the uh, training period during our session so we had to use our football language to communicate with them and sometimes we had to re- rely on the not sometimes in fact most of the time we had to rely on the local participants to get us around like i told you the place for food and run other errands like laundry printing of notes using internet cafes and everything so um yeah so this is what these are the type of challenges we face there and uh, one of the biggest challenge for us is okay i i i'm a person i can wake up normally at by 6 o'clock by 6 o'clock i can wake up for a course and something like that but there in philippines we have to wake up at 4:15 we have to wake up at 4:15 am because our first session is at uh 5:15 am first session is at 5:15 am our practical session so our sessions were quite early even before the sunlight um we are already training and just imagine the players who are coming to train with us they are taking the 3 am bus and it's a one and a half hour journey for them to travel to the field over there for us from the from the home stay to the field is only about uh, 10 minutes but for the guys it's one and a half minutes a uh, one and a half hours sorry one and a half hours for them to travel in the bus and they have to come there without any breakfast so they will be em- on playing on empty stomach which we only realize on the third day that they are coming on empty stomach to play so from the i think from the second day only we knew so from the third day onwards what we did was our whole course everyone chipped out money and we got one of our local participant to get them breakfast so after the session they can have some breakfast so this is some of the things we did for the players you know in fact because they are they are coming to help us out as a specimen as a player specimen to help us during our practical sessions so this was this was like something like the least we could do for them like food and drinks and we were quite happy to do it also okay the a key learning points throughout this course is uh yeah like i told you so our players most of them uh, uh in fact most of them were not able to speak english um like i told you they were from villages also and only had primary education most of the national players in uh, philippines who are playing in the under 16 and under 18 they have only studied until primary education level they never go to secondary education level uh, most of them probably i can say about 70 30 on a ratio so they do not understand english and we had our local coaches to help us translate to the players when we are taking them for sessions so which was okay for us you know somehow or rather they knew what what is going on so uh, the the most important thing when you go to a country where in fact in fact i was quite surprised because i was very con- confident that because philippines is a is a normal normally when we see the you know the domestic helpers here you know they speak very good english you know coming from villages and also my my assumption is they will you know the people there will understand english and they can speak good english but actually it's not the place which we were in and the place we had they totally they can't understand english and can't speak english so um my players understood the topic we are coaching you know like i told you we speak the same football language but uh, they were not able to understand when the game is stopped for corrections and uh, like you know there is a like we are conducting a session and there is a mistake we need to correct so i had to stop the session at that point of time players do not understand why i am i stopping the session what am i trying to do actually i'm trying to recreate the whole situation and make them understand where they went wrong where the goalkeeper went wrong or the goalkeepers went wrong so um the outfield players who are playing also they didn't understand why is the game is stopped so i had to re- literally explain to them that they should have been doing this instead of this which is why the mistake happened or the error you know occurred um so like i told you i practically had to show the movement in order for them to understand a sequence normally a practical session given to us is 20 minutes but the instructor from saudi arabia is a, is, a, is a very good guy and he totally is a understanding instructor he clearly understood that there were there were a lot of uh, language barriers for foreign participants to convey their messages and uh, our instructions to the players 
so uh, he was really lenient towards us and he probably give us like additional five minutes leeway and in fact he also came in he guided us through the sessions we took charge before our practical test you know our practice with the boys he literally come and you know guide us from the back you know you will tell us okay you have to do this you have to do that it's okay just take your time okay don't hurry you know make sure because his whole motive was make sure the players understood the session so we also we also want that also so in fact we and the instructor we literally we were we synchronized ourselves you know based on because he himself he had problem talking to them in uh, english so he understood where we were also standing in his shoes okay the key learning points um from this course is what i learned is the physical growth the growth spurt uh, i think some of you all know what growth spurt is the the changes in your in your skeletal function um in your body so um uh, like how how do i put it huh? like okay like increase in height um and and how do you rate the the the, the children the, the level of their height their 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 physique and everything so um and the development of goalkeepers in terms of physical technical tactical conditioning and psychological and there are five levels of development basically in uh, for goalkeeper coaches to note um like 8 to 10 years old 10 to 12 years old 12 to 14 years old 14 to 16 years old 16 to 21 years old so we were in the 16 to 21 years old during this course we were taking all the 16s and the 18s you know like i told you that uh, level 2 is a preparing for us to take a uh, higher level like uh, at least a professional level uh, goalkeepers um so what i learned from this course is this is one of the code where after this course i used on my goalkeepers which are goalkeepers i was i was taking i use this code because it is it is very very meaningful code because 99% concentration is 100% failure so what what does this this whole statement says that you can you can focus the game for 89 minutes but on the 90th minute when you lose focus and the goal you concede and because of you you the you know the team loses a game is total failure for the whole team so which is why i always emphasize this whole quote that you can be you can i always tell my goalkeepers you can be focused for 99% but that last 1% if you are not focused that that's when the ball is going to go into the back of the net so i make sure they they are always on 100% concentration during game before game 100% con concentration during game 100% concentration once they walk out that's where i ask them to ease themselves relax and everything calm down and everything so um the confidence and resilience building you know resilience building for goalkeepers like uh, the capacity to recover quickly from any situation um the toughness mental toughness and basically okay basically is like springing back into shape how they spring back once if they are receiving a shot and they have to go down collapsing uh position they have to go down maybe they parry the ball out on the ground how are they going to spring back into shape for the second ball so this is how we will work on them work on these these aspects and um i learned that young keepers need models not critics um we have seen you know in videos in in throughout our our youth football senior football you know there will be some coaches you know who are always giving criticisms um you know for every mistake you criticize 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 so we learn through this course that there should be a ratio system when when you are criticizing keepers because we do not want them to stop playing football and lose their interest in goalkeeping so um we learned that there's a ratio throughout this course you know the the instructor always emphasize on this ratio system like for age 9 to 12 we have to go on a ratio system 7 is to 1 so for every um um mistakes you correct you need to give them their praises also when it's due and for 12 to 16 years old 
three is to one ratio system. For 16 plus, one is to one ratio system. You know, for every every critic you give, there should be one motivational um, comment you should be also rendering to them. So we are now following during this course in the 16 plus each group. So it's a, we are on a one to one ratio. So when they when they are doing their mistakes and error has been made, we have to teach them because we have to always remember that if there is no mistakes, there's no learning. So definitely there's bound to be mistakes. As a goalkeeper coach, we need to realize that also. So uh, these are the things which, um, you know, motivated me throughout the course, you know, to learn much more about how to handle goalkeepers. You know, we can teach them a lot of things, you know, a lot of skills, techniques, all this we can teach. But these are the things, how the, the uh, psychological aspect, I think I think most of the, most of us, I think, I, I feel that we are lacking in this issue, how to tackle this psychological things with uh, our goalkeepers or probably in any sports, any sports, any coaches, how are they lacking in their psychological thing, you know, towards their athletes. So, uh, so this is something I learned there. And uh, the implications for goalkeeper coaches. Okay, there actually is, actually this is a very good uh, thing we, actually I realized during this call also. We have to carefully design our training activities according to their age. You know, I, I have also done this mistake when I was a junior coach. You know, I, you know, we, when you are a junior coach, you will see a club and, oh, you would like to follow this kind of training setup. But actually, no. You, I realized when later phases of my life that I have to cater my training according to what I have, who I have. So that's, that's how I learned throughout my years of experience. So I always cater my training. I have to carefully design looking at their age group looking at their capabilities, their abilities, and who I have, and what is the number I have. So based on that, I have to carefully design my training activities. So these are, these are the most important things I learned, are focusing on technique. Um, these are, the focusing on the technique part is mostly on the nine to 12 age group, 12 to 16, 16 plus onwards, not much on a technique base because they, they, they already knew, know what to do. It is mostly on their positioning, their conditioning you have to look at and um, their psychological uh, strength, building up their psychological strength, their tactical strength and their physical strength. But technical wise, I think above 16 plus, probably by the time they are 18, they, they already know their techniques, what they should be doing. In fact, in fact, we have also seen high level football uh, goalkeeper, goalkeepers who are, who do, you know, um, textbook mistakes, you know, textbook mistakes they will do. So uh, we have also seen that, but you know, that is not actually their technique problem that is, that has became their habit. So how are we going to focus on these issues is something uh, I learned during this course. And I learned that this is something from my instructor. I learned physical inability is only temporary. Actually, what does he mean by that is, um, let's say a boy who is, uh, 16 years old, he's, you know, he's, a, he's not so tall, he's a short goalkeeper. You know, he's, you know, he's still in the growing phase. So, um, just because he let in a, a, a high ball and he can't reach it, doesn't mean it's, it's a physical inability. Because uh, he's still in the growing stage and it's only temporary. So, as goalkeeper coaches, I need to know that this kind of things, their growth is only temporary. You know, when they come to a certain age, we know that, yeah, this is the max they can shoot up. Yeah. So they are only capable of this, this, these things. If they are short and they are still goalkeepers, like, you know, young kids, you know, when they are, they are playing and they let in a high ball, you know, sometimes they will be uh, morally uh, down and they will be very demoralized. They will sometimes be crying after the game. So this is the statement I always use on them. Uh, I always tell them that, Always remember, physical inability is only temporary. It is not permanent. So as you grow up, you will definitely save these kind of high balls. So I always teach them this kind of um, thing when I'm taking my academy boys and uh, my tertiary uh, girls. Okay, and also uh, how to make do with the facilities and living conditions and focus on passing the course. Okay, um, like like I told you earlier, what were the challenges we faced? Uh, facilities we had 
and uh, the living condition we, we we were staying in, like I told you, the homestay is practically. And I, I I think I missed out telling you all, and it's uh it is probably a three minute walk up a slope, a steep slope with staircase, uh, walking up to our homestay. So just imagine from training, you finish training, you come back so tired, and to walk up that slope is very demoralizing. Uh, so every day we will walk up and down that staircase, you know, but oh, it also served as a purpose, you know, for us as an exercise also. So I, I just took it in a good good stride. And um, my our main focus was to, you know, do well for the course and pass the course with flying colors. So, you know, being a uh, foreign participants and, you know, um, being sponsored by uh, Coach SG and Sport SG, I, I made sure that I do the best in the course and I gain as much as knowledge as I can and I come back and I um, share it and I teach to the uh, the youth goalkeepers, the tertiary goalkeepers and the pro- professional goalkeepers when I'm taking in future. So, um, some positive feedback about the course. Okay. Um, I hope you can see the screen. Um, so, positive feedback about the course is the Philippines FA had very good administration. Okay, um, the administration made sure that we have reached the homestay. They, they, they call and check on us. Our attire was prepared, you know, one day before the course uh, and uh, ready to wear it. And um, let's say if the sizes we gave and the sizes we, uh, and the shirts we got, you know, you know, sometimes the different polo tees and t-shirts, the sizes may vary. Um, if not, if they were not correct, you know, they were immediately willing to change it for to a next size or a size lower. And the training field was good. It was very good because that the field was only one year old and it was relatively a new, brand new artificial turf field. And it was ready every morning and afternoon for us. The courseware was very good and informative. Our logistics were always ready for us to use like the balls, markers, beeps, cones, and goals and the players. You know, players were always there. I, I can't remember one day they were late. Probably, I think there's only one day because the bus was late to fetch them and they reached exactly at 5.15. Normally, they will be there by 4.45. So, they reached at 5.15. Only on that particular day, if I remember correctly, we started the training at 5.30 a.m. And bottled water was always stocked up at the training field area for us to consume. So, the Philippines FA... Whatever the participants needed, they made sure it is it is there for us for in in terms of training wise and the courseware wise, it was always there. Um, the the course was throughout seven days, uh, but I this is just for sharing. But throughout the course, um, one of the one of the participant had um, heart attack. One of the participant had a heart attack and. Uh, he was out of the course. He actually gave up the course, but the instructor was was really very, very good instructor. He understood his whole situation and he was in hospital, you know, with the tubes and everything on and people took picture of him. The participants went to visit him and they came back and told the instructor. The instructor was very understanding and he told the senior player, he's, he's uh, 60 plus, he's I think about 63 He's taking his goalkeeper level. He's a former Philippines national goalkeeper in the 70s. So um, the instructor told him, let me know which day and time are you free. I'll be in Philippines until this date and I will do the practical test for you. I'll do it for you. We'll just get the players and I'll just cater the uh, things, uh, the training, uh, the assessment for you. But uh, that uh, our cosmate, he was... He was okay. He came back the next day and we made sure that he did his practical test first and the instructor allowed him to go back to the room to rest or go back home to rest because uh, he was really not well. But we had to really salute to him for his uh, determination and his never give up attitude. So this was something to share with you all. And um, the classroom, like I told you, was located at the homestay. We were located and it was only like um, two minutes walk to the classroom from our, our rooms. 
so our theory session was was quite okay because we just have to walk down the staircase and we just cross the road and the hall is just there for us to use and um, like i told you in earlier the classmates they were always uh, very uh, accommodating they carpool the foreign participants to the training ground and back you know every day until we go to the airport they even dropped me and my classmate uh, william at the airport also and uh, they always bring us to different western food places to eat you know make sure we try all the uh, western food in uh, philippines and uh, they brought us to all the new shopping centers there were some new shopping centers were open so these are some of the admin things you know we we did during our free time in fact in fact there was very little free time probably one day we had about the most two hours free time most of the time we will be in the room or in the internet cafe doing our assignment so um uh, that's why i need to thank the local participants who are always ready for us there and help us hey, like probably like about 9 pm i'll be like knocking on one person's door asking them can you um couple me to the internet cafe i need to print out something i need to do something i need to download something then they'll be okay can uh, just give me 5 minutes and we'll go so oh, they also never uh, like you know some 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 guys will be petty i i've been to few overseas countries for causes uh, some guys will be petty oh why don't you top up my petrol for me but these guys were totally friendly and accommodating they never talked anything single thing about you know topping up their petrol so like in exchange what we will do is we will uh, bring them for food uh, for lunch or dinner and uh, myself and william uh, just just something to take away um we throughout the seven days course i think probably five days we will we will be doing charity every day we go out we will be uh, donating some money to the, the 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 kids who are on the streets you know they are begging for food or begging for money and there was this day i remember uh, myself and william the, there were seven to eight kids they were asking for kfc chicken and we were inside buying food so we bought them uh, two big buckets of chicken i think 24 pieces of chicken or something with drinks and fries and everything we make sure they had good food to eat and um every, every time when we enter shopping center there will be the kids waiting asking for something so what we will do is sometimes i'll give them some money or whatever i buy inside from the supermarket i'll give them some like the plates and buns and uh, crackers you know for them to eat so you can literally see that 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 whole place is a totally remote village area and the shopping centers what i was telling you about is uh, is outside the village we had to go drive outside the village to access to the shopping centers so wherever we we were staying there was no public transport unless we had to wait for the jeepney which comes like maybe 30 minutes once and they only go to certain places only and we do not know most of the places there and you can't walk anywhere there and because outside our Our homestay is just a, a highway, highway kind of road. So there won't be people walking. There will always be vehicles only. Um, you know, going, you know, speeding off that area, and we have to be very careful when we are when we are outside. Uh, so these are the things I have gone through the throughout the whole seven days in uh, Philippines. So I I went with some impression, you know, okay, we are staying in a town area and everything. Um, I did my research but in the, during my research they never say the Kamona is a is a remote village and all and it's outside Manila so they just say that it it is part of Manila so I thought that we are inside Manila but it was it was actually totally outside Manila and um it is it is very poor thing to see you know the people there you know asking for food you know they eat leftover food on the table you know sometimes we will we eat our lunch or dinner finish when we are leaving they will come into the restaurant to take the food which is uh which we have ate the leftovers so it's very sad to see all these kind of things there but whatever it is uh when we were there we did good for the people also so i'm quite happy about going for this course and um yeah um chanyam okay uh thanks jasper for his uh, candid sharing for his experience at the uh, his course and right now we would like to open the